Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, from the cross, looked down upon your mother, overwhelmed with grief and tears, and so truly took compassion on her sorrow, commending her to the care of your disciple John, as also you commended John, and in him, all of us, to her maternal care. Grant me to love and honour your mother with the purest and most ardent love, that I may have her for my mother, and be worthily acknowledged by her as her son. Grant that in every necessity, and especially at the hour of my death, I may find her ever present and at hand to help me. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who with your wounds gaping and your head crowned with thorns, while hanging in misery upon the cross, declared that you were without any consolation. Grant that in all adversity and times of temptation and desolation, I may fly with faith to you, my most holy Father, and putting no confidence in myself, grant that I may place all my hopes in you alone, and entirely resign myself and trust in you. Wound my innermost soul with the remembrance of your wounds, write and imprint them upon my heart. Satiate me wholly with your blood, that all my intentions may be fixed in you alone, and that I may seek and find and hold you fast, possessing you for ever and ever. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when your body was exhausted from the loss of blood, gasped for breath, and cried out on the cross that you were tormented with thirst, while you burnt with unspeakable desire for our salvation. Give me grace to thirst most ardently after your honour and the salvation of souls, and be ready cheerfully to spend my, myself for them, according to your will. Grant that no love of any transitory object may possess my soul, that I may never attach myself to any creature, and that even when I am bound to love, I may love only in you. But give me grace to love you above all, and with my whole soul, and quietly to rest in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were thirsty even at the point of death, permitted a sponge filled with vinegar to be offered to you, and that by tasting of this you might make satisfaction for our gluttony, giving us an example of poverty. Grant me the grace to despise any unlawful pleasure and delight, and to avoid any excess in eating and drinking, and may I use with moderation and thanksgiving whatever you do give me for the support of my poor body. So cleanse, I beg you, the taste of my heart, that it may relish nothing except that which is pleasing to you, and may find nothing but bitterness in whatever displeases you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, you, the greatest lover of the human race, who when you were, you were bringing out the work of our redemption to a close, brought yourself as a holy victim upon the altar of the cross for the sin of all mankind. May this be the only end, I beg you, of all my thoughts, words and works, namely, to seek your honour with an upright and sincere heart, and to desire nothing save you alone, Grant that I may never grow weary or lukewarm in your service, but a fervent spirit always be ever renewed within me that I may daily more be more and more inflamed to love and praise you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who willingly underwent death when commending yourself to your Father and bending your adorable head. You gave up the ghost, and thus by laying down your life for your sheep, showed yourself to be the Good Shepherd. You are dead, only begotten Son of God, you are dead, my beloved one, that I may live for ever. What hope, what confidence is laid up for me in your death and in your blood? I glorify you, I give you thanks as far as in me lies. Give me grace to die entirely to sin and all evil desires, and to live to you alone. 
May I think of you alone. May my understanding exercise itself in nothing except you. That, clad in your grace and with holy charity, I may soon after the close of this life come to you, the true paradise. O good Jesus, by your bitter passion and death, grant to me the living pardon and grace, and to the faithful departed rest and everlasting light. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, at whose death the sun withdrew its light, and the veil of the temple was divided in two. The earth quaked, and the rocks were cut, and the graves open. May the rays of your grace never leave me, I beg you, you son of righteousness, you that are my God, may they always lighten even the very inmost recesses of my heart, that I may joyfully serve you for ever. Tear away from me the veil of hypocrisy, make the ground of my soul quake with saving penitence, rend in two this heart of stone of mine, that, being wholly renewed within, I may despise anything perishable, and love only the things that are of heaven. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 8. It came about after a short time that he went through the town and country, giving the good news of the kingdom of God. And with him were the twelve, certain women who had been made free from evil spirits and diseases. Mary named Magdalene, from whom seven evil spirits had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's chief house servant. Susanna and a number of others, who gave him of their wealth for his needs. A great number of people came together, and men from every town went out to him. He gave them teaching in the form of a story. A man went out to put in seed, and while he was doing it, some was dropped by the wayside, and it was crushed underfoot, and was taken by the birds of heaven. Some went on the rock. When it came up, it became dry and dead, because it had no water. Some went amongst thorns, and the thorns came up with it, and it had no room for grip. Some falling on good earth, came up and gave fruit a hundred times as much. With these words he said in a loud voice, He who has ears, let him give ear. His disciples put questions to him about the points of the story. He said, To you is given knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others they are given in stories, so that seeing they may not see, and although they hear they will not make sense to them. Now this is the point of the story. The seed is the word of God. Those by the side of the road who give ear, and then the evil comes, evil one comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not have faith and get salvation. Those on the rock are those with who, who with joy give hearing to the word, but having no root they have faith for a time, but when the test comes they give up. Those which went amongst the thorns are those who give hearing, and go on their way, but are overcome by the cares and wealth and the pleasures of life, and they give no fruit. Those in the good earth are those who, having given ear to the word, keep it with a good and true heart, and in quiet strength give fruit. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed but puts it on a lampstand, so that those who come in can see the light. Nothing is hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be made known and brought to light. Listen carefully, for whoever has will will be given more. But whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. Now Jesus' his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not get near to him because of the crowd, and so he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied to them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the God word of God and do it. Now on one of those days he entered into a boat, himself and his disciples, and he said to them, let us go to the other side of the lake. And so they launched out, but as they sailed he fell asleep. A wind storm came down on the lake, and they were taking on dangerous amounts of water. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we're dying! He awoke, and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and it was calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? Being afraid, they marvelled, saying to one another, Who is this, then, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? They arrived in the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus set a strong example here, for it is clear that he was constantly about his business. We read that he went from town to town preaching, taking the twelve with him, so that they might be further educated whilst they were on the road. Thus, we can form the impression that Jesus never stopped talking. He was either preaching to the world at large, or he was indulging in private tuition for those who were closest to him. 
Not only was Jesus constantly preaching, but he was constantly on the move, crossing backwards and forwards across the countryside, so that the entire area was covered. Sometimes we read that he was given a big welcome, and sometimes not. But he was constantly on the move. There is no excuse for anyone to say, but I never had a chance to meet him. We are also told how Jesus was supported whilst he was travelling. For we read in verses 2 and 3 that Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Susanna gave up their wealth to meet his needs. Wherever possible, we should always try and give freely to support those who have dedicated their lives to the Lord's work, at least ensuring that they are clothed, fed and given shelter. Matthew 10, 5-15 also recalls the instructions he gave to the disciples when they were sent out to the towns and the villages in pairs to further the work. We might safely assume that these were based on the principles used by Jesus himself. The servant of Christ is tireless. He or she is constantly engaged in his work and should be given whatever assistance and support they need to be able to continue this work. This is not the same as becoming lazy or fat off the land with a substantial bank balance. For these things are not at all suitable for a servant of Christ, who should have no use whatsoever for these things. But a bowl of simple food, a fire for warmth, and a, re a shelter from the weather. The parable of the sower is well known, and is well explained here by Jesus to the disciples. However, let us set aside the familiarity, just for a moment, and ask ourselves a simple question. Where are we in the scheme of things? Are we on the path or on the fertile soil? Are we being choked by weeds or are we flourishing? How deep is our faith rooted? Are we strong enough to remain in the faith even when the going gets hot under the midday sun, and all the round wither and fall away? Are we in the first flash of growth, but are all show with nothing under the ground to support us? Can we fight off the attacks of the world, those deadly thistles which seem to overcome everything but the strongest plant? Let us pray that our faith can establish strong roots and grow resilient to all the thorns that our challenges can throw at us. Then in verse 16, we are reminded that if we light a lamp, we put it in a place from whence it can shine its light over as great a span as possible. We do not attempt to hide it. Likewise, we who have received the light, the gospel, must allow it to shine in our lives, so that others might also see it and ask whence it comes. If we are Christians, we have a duty to our Lord to fly his flag from our masthead. Yes, it is to invite criticism and persecution. People may well laugh at us and consider us stupid, but that is a small price to pay for our salvation in Christ. Whoever we might be, let our faith shine in the darkness of the world around us. Secondly, we read that it is impossible to hide things other than for a short time. There are three ways in which we can try to hide. We can try and hide things from ourselves, or from each other, or from God. If we attempt to hide things from ourselves, it just shows us how stupid we are, for only a fool would try to do this. Suppose we knew we were unwell but denied it to ourselves. What would be the purpose, other than to deny any prospect of treatment until it was too late? We could deny we had a toothache. But no matter how hard we try to deny the patently obvious, sooner or later we would end up at the dentist. The longer we try to hide, the worse the consequences. We may try to hide things from other people, but the truth will always come out. Years ago, the father of an old friend of mine shared the story of his two children who grew up on the farm, a boy and his younger sister. One year the girl was given a cloth doll stuffed with corn seed. The boy was very jealous and stole the doll 
and buried it at the bottom of the garden. The doll could not be found anywhere. Smugly, the brother thought he had gotten away with it. A year later, the father called the young lad and took him down to the bottom of the garden, where something really quite remarkable had happened. There was a crop of wheat growing in the shape of the corn doll. There are also those who think they can hide from God. However, we know that this is impossible, as Adam and Eve found in Genesis 3. Indeed, in Genesis 16:13, we read that God is the God who sees everything. Then in verse 18, we learn the importance of listening. Not only must we hear, but we must listen attentively. Those who continue to listen and to seek the knowledge of God as everything else in life will continue to learn and expand their understanding. However, those who decide they cannot be bothered to learn will realise that they start to forget. An aeroplane, for example, must continue to travel forwards in excess of a certain speed to remain in the air. If we stop bothering to learn or to keep our bodies in shape, we will find ourselves drifting backwards, losing what we once might have had. It is not difficult to see that at least during his lifetime, Jesus' family was not in sympathy with him. Mark 3.21 tells us how his family came and tried to restrain him because they believed him to be mad. In Matthew 10.36, Jesus warns his followers that a man's foes may well be those of his own household, and he was speaking out of hard and bitter experience. There is in this passage a great and practical truth. It may very well be that a man finds himself closer to people who are not related to him than he does to his own kit than kin. The deepest relationship of life is not merely a blood relationship. It is the relationship of mind to mind and heart to heart. It is when people have common aims, common principles, common interests, and a common goal that they really and truly become kin. Let us remember that definition of the kingdom which we have previously worked out. The kingdom of God is a society upon earth where God's will is as perfectly done as it is in heaven. It was Jesus' supreme quality that he alone succeeded in fully achieving the identity of his will and the will of God. Therefore, all those whose one aim in life is to make God's will their will are the true kindred of Jesus. We speak of all men being the sons of God, and in a very real and precious sense, that is true, because God loves saint and sinner. But the deepest kind of sonship is ethically conditioned. It is when a man puts his will in line with God's will, by the help of the Holy Spirit, that real kinship begins. The Stoics declared that that was the only way to happiness in this life. They had the conviction that everything that happens, joy and sorrow, triumph and disaster, gain, loss, sunshine and shadow, was the will of God. When a man refused to accept it, he battered his head against the walls of the universe, bringing himself nothing but pain and trouble of the heart. When a man looks up to God and says, Do with me as you wish, he has found the way to true joy. From this, two things emerge. There is a loyalty which surpasses all earthly loyalty. There is something which takes precedence of the dearest things on earth. And in that sense, Jesus is a demanding master, for he will share a man's heart with nothing and with no one. Love is necessarily exclusive. We can only love one person at a time, and only serve one master at a time. This is hard, but there is this great wonder, that when a man gives himself absolutely to Christ, he becomes one of a family whose boundaries are the earth. Whatever loss he may experience is more than counterbalanced by his gain. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In him 
shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden call, close binding all mankind. Join hands then, brother of the faith, whate'er your race may be. Who serves my father as a son is surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet north and south. All Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. The man who, through Jesus Christ, seeks the will of God has entered into a family which includes all the saints in heaven and in earth. The association of Christ with the boat, with which we are so familiar in the Gospel history, has been preserved in much of the poetry, the literature and the art of the Church. A very old seal ring represents the Church as its ship struggling against the winds, supported by a great fish in the sea beneath, and with two doves sitting on its mast and fro. The shape often given to Christian places of worship in the early ages was that of a boat, and the idea has entered into Christian song and thought. Keeble catches the tone of the centuries when he inserts into the evening hymn the following verse. Thou framer of light and dark, steer through the tempest thine own ark. Amid the howling wintry sea, we are in port if we have any. The keynote of all this symbolism is given in the, the following incident. The sea was at rest when the disciples took Jesus as he was. As they sailed on the smooth waters, the weary prophet fell asleep. On a sudden down comes the squall, one of those furious hurricanes, which sweep across a lake 600 feet lower than the ocean, with gigantic funnels support, supplied by the deep ravines cut by the action of wild watercourses. All is changed. There is heard now only the despairing cry, Master, do you not care that we perish? Such is life. Changeful now the smiling sunshine with the clear blue sky, again the driving cloud and rain, with angry waves breaking over the craft. Job was at rest, his sons and daughters feasting together. He himself, with abundance and peace, fearing God and eschewing evil, when the one terrible day came on which the messenger chased messenger, completing a tale of destruction and bereavement. How often does destruction fall as in a moment? The fitful weather of the inland lake is a type of fitful climate, followed by the rapidly dissolving scenery the present time. How foolish it is to set the affection on things below. How sad when there is no Christ in the ship, when there is no fixture amongst the sundry and many changes of this world, where only the true joys are to be found. The stilling of the tempest is a miracle. We seem to see the sleeping master quietly raising himself, looking around, meeting the gaze of the all but frantic men standing erect in the boat, sending forth the majestic, Peace, be still. What manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Yes, what manner of man? He is himself the miracle, the one made of God to us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. The work is the sign of himself, in that deeper work in which he is manifest as the saviour of sinners. What is that work but the rebuking of the storm of passion and all the influences which are adverse to peace of mind and holiness of life? Be still is the Christ word. Peace to you is the Christ breath. In the world of man he makes the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they are quiet so he brings them to their desired haven. Is this not the experience of every truly converted life? And so for all the days, let Christ be awakened, writes St. Augustine. Though the tempest beat into it, yet it not win or fell thy ship, 
Thy faith will command the wind and the waves, and thy danger will be over. O oh, see to it that you take Christ into your heart, even as he is. Blessed for you, O needy sinner, when the Master is really the occupant of your life, your present help in trouble. And then we have the reproof of little faith. Why are you so fearful? asked Jesus. Why, when you know who is with you, when you know that he is here, that it is not some enemy, some devil, that has control of the enemies or circumstances? Why are you so easily cast down? Why do you give way so readily? Why do you fall into such despondency, such grief? May we not, in many an hour of shrinking, if not in terror, hear this, why, standing in our hearts, where is your faith? is the part of the word reported by Luke. Assume that you have it, that you are really trusting as Christ, your master. Where does your faith go when you are so fearful? Is it not the moment of trial that proves the readiness and the serviceableness of the faith? Do we not often need to seek it when we have occasion for it? Verily a question most pertinent to us in the varying circumstances and demands of our life. Think. Think over the adverb so suggested. Where is your faith? Let us pray. O Lord, we pray that your grace may always be present and follow us, making us continually given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.